Jesus elevates the individual and his church. I don't know how he pulls that off, but he does. And he knows you. Jesus is our good shepherd who laid down his life for our atonement. He is our good shepherd who knows each of us and invites us to know him in intimate affinity. And he is our good shepherd for the sheep when a hired man who is not a shepherd and does not own the sheep sees a wolf coming he leaves the sheep and runs away so the wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them the hired man runs away because he is only a hired man and does not care about the sheep I am the good shepherd as the father knows me and I know the father in the same way I know my sheep and they know me. And I am willing to die for them. There are other sheep which belong to me that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them too. They will listen to my voice. And they will become one flock with one shepherd. The Father loves me because I am willing to give up my life in order that I may receive it back again. No one takes my life away from me. I give it up of my own free will.
midst of a series of messages looking at Jesus' I am statements in the book of John. We've already considered his statement, I am the bread of life, which covers the simplicity and sufficiency of faith in him. And last Sunday we looked at I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light and we are his reflection. And then here in John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18, and since you have just heard it and seen it, and you have it open in front of you, I hope, I won't read the whole text. But Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And this was a motif, uh, an analogy that Jesus used frequently because he lived in a culture that uh, uh, had, had lots of shepherds and lots of sheep. And this was an analogy that his listeners could easily relate to. But he took it just a little farther. He didn't just say, I am the shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. And the word good comes from the Greek word kalos, which means beautiful and intrinsically good. Good all on its own. Not good because of something that has been done or good because of behavior, but good at the core, in the essence of who that one is. And of course, we learn from Scripture, God is good. He's the definition of good. He's not good because of what He does. He's not good because of what He gives us or because we're having a good morning. He's good because He is good. And so when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, He was making a big statement. Now, in the first part of this section, which is verses 11 through 13, Jesus said, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And if you're a note taker, you want to watch for three A's this morning. And the first A is atonement. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, which was a change. Because if you know anything about Jewish culture, especially during the Old Testament era, and then all the way up in the New Testament era until the crucifixion, <laughs> under the law, sheep usually died for the shepherd, not the other way around. Now, they did not eat a lot of their sheep because that would be bad for the economy. But they used the wool and they used some other things. But then they also had this sacrificial system whereby lambs would be taken to the priest and slaughtered and placed on the altar as atonement for sin. Therefore, in Jesus' day, a lot of lambs, a lot of sheep were dying for the shepherds and others. But here comes Jesus and he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And this represents a pretty radical change. And only the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Did you notice? The hired man, he said, runs away. Even your best friends, and I don't mean to be pessimistic. Uh, I, I believe in a positive outlook on life. But we're also realistic in that we understand, let's face it, we all let one another down once in a while, don't we? We fail. And we give it our best. Most of the time we don't want to, but we fail. Even the ones that we love the most, we fail at times. And so Jesus was saying, when the wolf comes and when the flock is attacked, the hired people run away because the sheep don't belong to them. They're not going to sacrifice their life for the sheep. But the shepherd, that's another story. And only the good shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep. Of course, Jesus is our good shepherd. And because he is God incarnate, it needs to be stated, he willingly lays down his life for us. He chose to do this. It was not forced upon him. In fact, in verse 18, he said as much. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. Because he is God. However, even though Jesus is God incarnate, 100% divine and 100% human, we must never minimize the willing aspect 
of his sacrifice. To give his life was a hard thing for Jesus to do. His humanity did not want to die. No one wants to die. And yet he did this. However, it was so difficult for him that on the night before he was crucified, Luke records this prayer that Jesus prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And then being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Never minimize the sacrifice that Jesus made. Yes, he is God. Yes, there was resurrection coming. He said, I lay down my life willingly, I take it up. I have this authority. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it back up again. It is his sacrifice that has provided our atonement. It allows us to gather here in this way today to celebrate the salvation that we enjoy in faith, knowing that his sacrifice provided our atonement, maybe makes a familiar psalm even more precious. When King David wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, and I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death itself, I fear nothing. For you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me even in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We have this good shepherd who has laid down his life to give us atonement for our sin. Secondly, there is affinity. Jesus says in verses 14 through 15, I know my sheep and they know me. Now this is an interesting statement and it's one that Jesus' listeners in his day, when he was actually verbalizing this teaching, they would have understood it. I don't know if you've ever spent much time around sheep. Uh, I, I, I haven't. You all know I'm, I'm an admitted city boy. I've not spent much time on any sort of farm. But I have National Geographic. <laughs> and I've watched some things. And I've learned. Uh, I watched a program just not too long ago about shepherds in the Middle East. This practice is still going on today. Because... There are lots of sheep and not a lot of land. Therefore, they will, will uh, uh, bring the sheep into the pen at night. Several different flocks of sheep will come into that pen. And then in the morning, they'll open the gate to the pen, and the sheep will begin to go out. And they, they filmed this, and I watched it. It was amazing. And here's all these shepherds, as many as half a dozen different shepherds, each with their own way of calling, each obviously with their own voice, and those sheep sorted themselves. Followed their shepherd. Because that's how they had been raised. And they had come to put great trust and confidence in that shepherd. Now the shepherds also know their sheep. They know what they need. They know that these sheep, although they look basically the same, they have different personalities. There are, there are wanderers in the group and there are those that will maybe eat a little too much or drink a little too much and they have to be watched over. And the shepherd knows. The, the animals have to be cared for. So the good shepherd knows his sheep and the sheep know the good shepherd. And that word that we translate know in English is gnosko in its original language which means to recognize, to perceive, to know. Think back in your life to the voices that you know. And you immediately respond to them. Because you know the person that that voice is attached to. Right? I remember as a kid growing up, it wasn't so much his voice, it was my dad's whistle. Because I grew up in an era like a lot of you, you'd go outside and play 
all day long, all summer long. And the rule was to come home when the street lights came on. But if I had to be home before then, or perhaps if it was summertime, my dad would stand out on the front porch and whistle. And I knew that meant, and he only whistled once. <laughs> come home now. <clears throat> and I'd drop whatever I was doing, and I would run home. Because in those days, I ran everywhere I went. I knew that whistle. I know my wife's voice. And whenever I hear that voice, it gets my attention. See how that works? Okay, Jesus, our good shepherd, knows you. But I have to ask, do you know him? See, he knows you because he made you. Never forget that while Jesus is 100% human, he is also 100% divine. He is God in the flesh. And John 1, 3 says, Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In fact, no matter how self-aware you are, Jesus knows you better. Even better than you know yourself. He knows your name. <coughs> Knows your name. Do you ever forget people's names? Yeah, I do, and I hate that. We don't like to do that. We like it when people know our names. Your Lord, your Good Shepherd, knows your name. And He knows your nature. Scripture teaches that God is always mindful that we are dust. In other words, He understands that at times we're weak, He understands that at times we are confused. He gets it. At times, we blow it. Now, that's not an excuse. It's just the fact that our good shepherd knows us. He will never give up on us. And he knows our needs. He knows our name. He knows our nature. He knows our needs. But as I said a moment ago, do you know him? Have you accepted him as your Savior? Have you made that decision in your life? If so... Don't look at that as an ending. Look at it as a beginning. We in the church make a mistake. We consider receiving Christ, once we get you saved, well, that's it. Okay, we're good. To receive Christ as Savior is the beginning of life, not the conclusion or climax of it. To receive Christ as Savior is the beginning of a journey. So if you're sitting here and you have received Him, are you building your relationship with Him? Do you know his voice? I suspect you do, because when you receive Christ as Savior, you were indwelt with the Holy Spirit, which allows you to recognize his voice. Not so much the verbal voice that comes into our physical ears, but the voice that speaks to your spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us with that. But here's the thing, if I know his voice, and I hear his voice, do I obey his voice? See, Jesus said in verse 27 of this same chapter, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. Jesus is our good shepherd. And he knows each of us individually better than we know ourselves. And he invites us to know him. To have that close personal relationship with him. And then third, there is acceptance. Now, in verse 16, Jesus makes a statement that some of the people listening to, uh, that were there listening to him may not have understood, and some of those who understood may have even been offended by this statement. Jesus makes the statement, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them in also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Anybody here Jewish? By, by heritage, by birth? This statement that Jesus made is good news for all of us because I'm not Jewish either. Guess who the other sheep are? You. Me. The Gentiles. The non-Jews. 
The same people that on the night before he was crucified, Jesus prayed, Lord, I don't just pray for my followers in the here and now. I pray for those who will come after through the testimony of the word. That's us. We are here today, First Congregational Church, part of the body of Christ gathering all over the world today because Jesus Christ said, I have other sheep too. Not just the children of Israel. It's us. We are given acceptance into the covenant that Jesus made first with Abraham and then with his children and then reconfirmed with Moses and then carried through, I believe, a covenant that is still in place today with the nation of Israel. But that's not all. Jesus expanded that whole thing. Remember, we celebrated the Lord's Supper last Sunday, and part of that an original time, when Jesus instituted that, in Luke 22, 20, he said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The new covenant. That's good news to all of us who weren't part of that that, that children of Israel covenant. Now it's, it's broadened. Paul explained it this way in Galatians 3. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with him. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. For you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's really good news. For all of us who are not Jewish by birth. And in fact, Jesus said we will someday be one flock. Well, that may not happen here on earth. We, we have a real difficult time with the concept of one flock. And here we are in 2018. Will we ever be one church united together? Probably not. We are one church within these walls. But there's a whole body of Christ out there. And they do things different than we do. But Jesus said, someday... Even Gentile and Jew will be one flock, he calls it. Revelation 7 describes this just a little bit. And it's interesting to me that this passage from Revelation 7 comes right after the description of the 144,000 that are sealed on earth. And the 144,000 are the 12 tribes of Israel. It says that right there. And it was that 12,000 from each one, from each of the 12 tribes. And together they make 144,000 sealed for evangelism on earth. Right after that, in Revelation 7, John wrote this. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, I don't know if you noticed on the little video we played it, uh, as the introduction to this message. But Jesus told another parable having to do with a Lamb. It's recorded in Luke 15. And Jesus said, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls to his friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one who repents and over 99 who do not. Sitting here today, again I ask you, do you know him as your Savior? If that is so, then are you following him? If you are, what are you dealing with here sitting in the pew this morning? Do you feel isolated at times? Feel like you're the only one in the whole 
whole world going through what you're going through? Well, that's probably not true, but I understand the feeling. And it is one of the strategies that the devil uses against us. Divide and conquer. Get us isolated to the point where we think we're the only one that's got to deal with this stuff. The point of that second parable that Jesus told is that the shepherd went looking for the man. That's what you saw portrayed in the video. That little lamb that was vulnerable and lost, didn't know how to find his way home. The shepherd went looking. Now there were other sheep back home, back in the safety of the pen. They were taken care of. But that one was as important to our Lord as the whole flock. Jesus elevates the individual and his church. I don't know how he pulls that off, but he does. And he knows you. Jesus is our good shepherd who laid down his life for our atonement. He is our good shepherd who knows each of us and invites us to know him in intimate affinity. And he is our good shepherd. And through him we are accepted. Tune in tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat chance.